Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. You may be seated. <coughs> so, heads up real quick, on Wednesday night we have a service at 7 p.m. Uh, we are going through a series in the month of, uh, or through the summer months, uh, called Unpopular. We are addressing some of the most unpopular topics uh, that uh, society doesn't really like to talk about. And we're going to the Bible and seeing what the Bible has to say about them. So far, throughout the month of June, we have addressed homosexuality, transgenderism, We've addressed gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then we have uh, now, next week, last, or last week, we talked about uh, denominationalism. So we talked about denominations, where they came from, uh, where they arrived on the scene. And then this Wednesday, we're going to talk about cultural Marxism. Uh, and so this is going to be an important conversation as it pertains to how our, our system and our country is working today. So we'll talk about cultural Marxism on Wednesday, what the Bible has to say about that. That'll lead us into conversations about uh, social justice and how social justice compares to biblical justice and what we should do as Christians uh, when we confront the ideology of cultural Marxism. So we'd love to have you with us on Wednesday as we look at that. Last week, we started looking at verse 7. We concluded that the word patience here in the original language of the New Testament uh, which is Koine Greek, is a makrothameo. Makrothameo uh, deals with patience with difficult people. Now, I know all of you have people in your lives that are difficult people, uh, but you're not one of them. Amen. Okay? No, we discovered that we are all those difficult people. In fact, we went back through the book of James all the way to the beginning, and we discovered 25 different types of, <coughs> of difficult people. We discovered that we're going to have to be patient with these difficult people for a while until Jesus comes back. There's always going to be difficult people. As long as humanity is around, uh, as long as we are breathing, we're going to be a difficult person in ways to people. Difficult people are going to be around until the end. That's the reality. So now James has reminded us of 25 different people uh, that are difficult to deal with, but he doesn't just leave us hanging there. He gives us some practical advice on how to deal with difficult people and difficult situations. And so today we're going to get through three of those, and then we'll get through the final three next week in verses 10 and 11. So let's cover the first one. It is to anticipate the return of Jesus. This is one of the ways that you can deal with difficult people, is to anticipate the return of Jesus. And we see this here in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it, uh, it receives the early and the late rains. One thing we have to consider uh, when we read texts like this is that the early church, when you signed up to be a Christian, the early church was persecuted because Christianity was illegal. So Christians were always on the run. They were always in hiding. They always were in poverty because they couldn't just go out and work in the forest. Once you identified yourself as a Christian, people wouldn't hire you. And this was a part of your life. We lived in a time frame where if it wasn't, or they lived in a time frame where it was either tyranny from their friends or people or family, or it was tyranny from the Roman government. <clears throat> this was back in a time where being a Christian actually cost you something. It wasn't sort of this like uh, sort of the societal norm and people went to church and it was okay, like it cost you something. So they weren't dealing with your common everyday annoyances of dealing with just difficult people. They were dealing with individuals that treated them harshly because of their faith in Christ. This raises the standard of dealing with difficult people. What are we to do if we're being persecuted and dealing with different difficult people? Well, it seems simple, but don't forget the great hope that every believer has. That Jesus is coming back for us. Oh, 
don't like it. Y'all are wig today. That's the costal on our Baptist costal for our Baptist friends. Okay? So, <laughs> and that's just Mike. That's a different story. But hmm. Jesus is coming back for us. And that makes all the stuff that we go through in this life worth it. It makes everything worth it. It's all going to come to an end. It's, and Jesus is, it's not just that he's going to come back. I don't believe in an escapism theology, which is that I just need to escape this place. I just need to run away to heaven. But Jesus isn't just going to pull us out of heaven and say, I'm just going to blow this place up and be done with it. He actually comes back and he, if you read the book of Revelation, he actually comes back and he makes the earth new again. He creates a new earth, a new heavens, a new Jerusalem. He, he restores everything that was stolen from him. He doesn't just leave it to pot and, and pull us out of it. It's not an escape-based theology. God is not an escape theologian. He is, a, he is a restorationist theologian. He believes in restoring what, he's, what, what has been torn away. So there's a coming a day when all of, all of it's going to end. The, the tears, the pain, the suffering, the illness, the, 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 the trials, the, the heartbreak, the, <coughs> the, the, the poverty, it's all going to come to an end. Our God, the Lord Jesus, will come in, not as some, some weak God who's just like, hey, I'm here. He's going to come in as a triumphant king of kings, riding on the white horse, and he's going to conquer every force of darkness that sought to take us out. Amen. Everything. Every demonic force that ever postured itself uh, up against us, every um, form of evil, and even our own sin, which sought to kill us and destroy us and take us out, he will bring justice to. This is the hope of every believer. The concept of anticipating the Lord's return fell, falls deaf on some of us here in the West. A persecuted church that is in poverty, that is struggling to meet, that have lost people, that, that are either in jail and incarcerated or have lost their lives uh, for the gospel, that church wakes up every day thinking about Jesus coming back. Because life's tough. Life is hard. But an affluent, comfortable, indulgent even church has very little interest in the return of the Lord. We have too many things left to enjoy and consume in this world. And our passions and our things for this world are too wrapped up in things that we still want to experience. We sort of sometimes have a temptation to lose our love and luster for eternity, which is so much greater than this earth. And so we begin to not only not look forward to the return of Jesus, but we also begin to love this world so much that we think, oh, I hope he waits a little bit longer, at least until uh, this point or this point or this point in my life. But the early church, they, they woke up every morning going, I, I, I want Jesus to come back now. Okay? Now, that's been the case for 2,000 years, and this has been the great hope of the church is the return of Jesus. The encouragement also came from the mouths of the apostles several times. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And you're talking about a guy right here. Well, let's read 2 Corinthians 4, 17. This is the Apostle Paul again. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. you got to keep in mind that this guy... Paul, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you learn that he was shipwrecked multiple times, left for dead, beaten within an inch of his life. He was thrown in prison multiple times. He was falsely accused. He went through all of these things in his life. I don't know about you, but I don't know that any of us could raise our, raise our hands and say that we've done that for the gospel. Okay, Paul's went through all this stuff, and look at the wording that he uses to describe his situation. Light momentary affliction. I don't think there's a single one of us in this room that are, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you're just more holy than I am. But if, if it was me in that case, I know that I would be a little bit more complainy and I would not be as, as, as have such a holy perspective as Paul did. But if I was beaten within an inch of my life, left shipwrecked, 
thrown in prison several times, I wouldn't have the attitude, light, momentary affliction. But Paul understands something that we have a hard time grasping sometimes, and that is heaven is so much greater. And the reward that waits on the other side for those who endure for the gospel of Jesus makes all of this <coughs> seem small. 1 Peter 1, 6-7, In this you rejoice, this is from Peter, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the testing... So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Most of the time, when people think of Christ's return, this is, what their, this is where their brain goes. They enter into speculation of what end times is going to look like. Now, I, 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 there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I love that conversation. I love diving in the Bible. We as a church covered the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation uh, a year ago. And, and, and God willing, we'll go back and finish the book. But I, as we looked at Revelation, I don't mind. I don't mind at all having that conversation. But we tend to just hyper-focus on events and blood moons and <coughs> all of these conversations, which are fine to have. Nothing wrong with that. But if we do that without looking at it as a way to encourage us to live a holy life, we're missing the full picture. Okay? The full picture is that the return of Christ being imminent spurs us on to realize that at any moment Jesus could blow the trumpet and, and here he comes back and, and, and he comes back and he rescues us from that. And, and I'm just telling you right now, I'll be honest with you, like if that thought and that notion scares you a little bit, that Jesus could blow the trumpet and come back now and you're like, eh, but there's things I need to, uh, then, you're, then there's your love for the world and your love for God is imbalanced. It's imbalanced. And, and you haven't yet fully come to a realization of what you're missing out on by staying here. Um, I don't want to stay here. I love my family. I love the, 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 uh, the, the blessings of God, but I'm telling you, I think if we got just even a small glimpse of heaven, I don't think that we would even think twice about staying around this place, all right? And then, of course, the new earth being just as glorious in itself. First John 3, 2 and 3, beloved, we are God's children now. You are God's child now. You don't belong to the world. You are not your own. Okay, you don't belong to daddy and pappy, you belong to God. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Now, this does not mean deity, this does not mean that we're divine in any way, shape, or form. Only God is divine. But what it means by we shall be like him is that we will be righteous like him. And it's not righteous because we have accomplished that righteousness, but he will give us the, robe, the robes of white uh, he will clothe us in his righteousness that he imputes and gives to us as a gift through his salvation. <coughs> when we appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You know, in the New Testament, there are 300 references to the second coming of Jesus. That means that if you were going through the book, one in every 13 verses is about the second, the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's an important thing. James uses an example here of a farmer uh, being patient, waiting on the late rains, which was a long time in their watches. Planting season was in October or November, and the late rain came in March and April. The key here is that the farmers are completely depending on an act of God for their provision. If God doesn't allow it to rain, if God doesn't make it rain, their crops won't grow and they don't eat. So you could talk about kind of being nerve-wracking, waiting on something to happen. This rain has to come or we don't eat. In the same way, we have no control over when the rain comes. We also have no control over when Jesus returns. He's going to come back on his own timetable. He's given us some signs to look for. And by the way, if you count them all up, they're all here. God has told us what to look for. The word patience here in this text, or patient, is makrafameo. It's the same word uh, that we have uh, studied before. The idea here, uh, down here, the, both of these words are makrafameo. Uh, the idea here is that the farmer... Uh, is waiting on a person. In this case, not a difficult person. 
He's waiting on a person, and that person is God. God's timing may feel difficult, but it's perfect. It always is. He's always right on time, and he always brings you exactly what you need right at the moment when you need it. Okay? He's not caught off guard. He's not, he's not distracted. He's not up there talking to his, his angels and, 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 and disregarding what's going on in your life. He has not forgot about his promise to return. In fact, if any of us feel like God has delayed his return, we should consider that mercy because he's allowing more people time to repent and turn from their sin. That family member that you have, that friend that you have that you've been praying for that doesn't know Christ, we pray that he delays only so that they might find Christ themselves. His provision may not always encompass what we want, but it will encompass what we need. The rain he brings is both literal and figurative. He rains down his mercy and his grace. He not only brings literal rain, but he actually <coughs> causes the seed to develop and to grow. In fact, he developed the whole ecosystem by which crops even develop. He created the seed. He created the, the, the growth process. He created the ground by which the, the seed goes into, and he developed the nutrients and how it feeds the seed and how it grows, and then he, he brings the water up into the clouds, and then he allows the clouds to release the rain. Literally, the entire process is all divine and all up to God. All he asks us to do is put the seed in the ground. Amen. That's all he asks us to do. And, and if, he doesn't need us to do that. He could... And blow all the seed around on the ground if he, if he had to. But he allows us to participate in what he does. So he says, you put the seed in the ground. I will literally do everything else. I'll make the seed grow. I'll bring forth the crop. I'll have the rain drop down. I will nourish everything. I will make it all work. And all you got to do is come in and reap the harvest. God literally does everything. So your trouble, whatever it may be, it's not insignificant. It's not small. I get that. Some of you are going through some really heavy stuff. But it is temporary. And, and I know that it feels like it's dragging out and it's really long right now. But, the, but eternity is going to make the time frame that you're going through what you're going through, it's going to make it look so small and so insignificant. For James to look forward to the second coming of Jesus is a big deal. Here's why. He's seen a lot. James was one of the three that were standing on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and Jesus pulled back part of his, his glory from his veiled flesh and very temporarily showed them part of his glory, and it was so overwhelming. They dropped on their face, and they were glowing, and it was just this powerful moment, like he's seen a little bit of the glory of God. He saw Jesus, uh, uh, the love of Jesus on the cross, and then he saw Jesus ascend uh, into the heavens. He saw all these things. And yet James still says, I can't wait for Jesus to come on the white horse because it's going to be just as even more glorious as what I've already seen. And he tells us to look forward to that. The second thing that we have to see is in verse 8, and that is to establish your hearts. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, the word here for establish is terizo, and it means to establish in a fixed location, to put something somewhere, okay? It means put your heart into an established location. How about the contrast here, verse 5, of what we looked at a couple weeks ago? You also be patient, establish your hearts. When earlier we saw James's uh, 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 heat that he applied to people who were misusing and abusing people and those who were overindulging, and he says, you fatten your hearts. We can forfeit the harvest that God has called us to with inaction and inconsistency. With allowing ourselves to not have a fixated heart solely focused on the purpose of of the gospel. I, I would contend this. I think one of the greatest sins of the church right now is inaction and inconsistency. It, it's people who are so inhibited by whatever 
by whatever cause, fear, fear's most of it, lack of love, but the church has sort of held back. Fathers are not stepping up into their role. Mothers are not stepping into their role. Kids are not, uh, they're pushed into the world rather into the gospel. And you have a church that's really lacking action, that lacks evangelistic efforts, that, that lacks a, a, a true a, a, a scripture studying and, 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 and the responsibility to, to push into that and receive and give discipleship. You have a church that's just held captive. You have a church that, well, I, do a, I show up and I'm, I do a couple things at church every now and again, and that's sort of my, my penance, if you will. But Jesus has called us to a radical life of servanthood, a radical life of servanthood, one that demands a sacrifice. And we're not saved by those actions, and we're not saved by the sacrifice. Jesus did all of that, and only he could. But that there is good works that we are called to. There is a purpose to which we are called to, and the church is held stricken by inaction. We just sit around why people go to hell. We just sit around why God's name is blasphemed and false doctrine all surrounds us, and we just shut up about it because we don't, we, we don't want to be mean. Or if, if somebody does post something on Facebook, we're not going to, I don't want to put my name on that, uh, or, or else I might get labeled. We have a church that's full of in, in, in people of inaction, inconsistency. I, I remember growing up, I'd go to youth camp, and uh, we get all fired up about Jesus. And it's easy to get fired up about Jesus at camp. You're in this euphoric environment. You've got your, uh, uh, I had my five camp girlfriends. And uh, just kidding, I, I, I had one if I was lucky. <clears throat> Don't tell my wife. It was, uh, it was, ter- it was BC Tara. Um, but, like, you'd have your camp girlfriends, you'd be hanging out all day long, and it was fun, it was blast, you know, you didn't have any responsibilities, you just hung out at the lake all day, and you just did all this stuff, right? And so then we get all dressed up, and we go to the tabernacle, and we have service, and they'd have, like, this dynamic speaker that they paid a lot of money to come in, he was like, blah, 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 blah. you know, he's, like, very, very, uh, uh, demonstrative, and we get all charged up, and then we have an emotional altar time, and we all at the altar and different things like that, and it was a powerful time. You come home all fired up about Jesus, and you come to church on Sunday morning and give your testimony about what Jesus did in your life, and then a week later, and because you go back into the real world, and you see that not ever, you did, it's not an atmosphere where there was only Christians, and you only did Christian things, you did devotions every morning, and you had services every night, and you get back in the real world, and you realize that things don't work that way. This is, uh, I, we have the kind of the camp fever when it comes to church on a week-by-week week basis. We come and we say, okay, I get really got convicted by this sermon uh, during worship. I was really, God was speaking in my heart. I came down to the altar. I, I bowed down and I, 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 I figured this all out. I'm, I'm going to get my life straight. And then Monday morning, pfft, and we're inconsistent. And I'm not saying we got to move mountains every week. But man, When are we going to buckle down and have discipline, our theme for 2023? When are we going to buckle down and be disciplined? When are we going to stick through on the commitments that we made to the Lord? I'm going to sit here for just a second because I think that's, I feel like that's really important. If we don't tell our schedule, our money, our energy, our family, our time, if we don't tell them what to do, they'll tell us what to do. You got to have a plan. I know you set out from family camp last year and you're like, I'm, we're going to do devotions and we're going to do this and we're going to do this and you're not doing them anymore. I just need another family camp so I can get back on the track. No, you don't. You just need to do... Do it again tomorrow. You need to get back on track tomorrow. You don't need another family camp to charge you back up and get that adrenaline shot. That You don't need church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night to be an adrenaline shot. What would our church services be like if it wasn't an energy source for your week and it was more you brought the energy that God did from your life into the building from that week? 
So rather than it be like a boost to get you through your week, rather it was you boosted other people and edified them because there was so much joy overflowing from the work of Christ in your life during the week. Like we got to flip the script a little bit. So whether it be singular in focus, singular in commitment, singular in motive, singular in purpose. Last thing, remember God's judgment. Verse 9, <coughs> do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now this is quite a flip in attitude here. We go from confronting those with the encouragement of Jesus' return to a stern reminder that he is the judge. What this is saying is that while Jesus' return does provide hope in the midst of difficulties, those that complain and grumble amidst their trials should remember that the judge is not on vacation. He's not out of the office. He's at the door. He's paying attention, and he's going to come in at any moment. Okay, so we have to remember that. Uh, you, you know, when you go to work and the boss isn't in that day, you know what's going to happen. Longer lunch breaks, longer breaks, more people standing around each other's desks talking throughout the day. This isn't one of those cases. The boss is not out of office. He did not leave his out-of-office email signature on. He is in the building, and he's watching. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 to 37. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Uh-oh. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Now, we, we covered this text here a while back, but I want to give a brief explanation this does not mean that salvation will come by the words you say and that condemnation to hell will come by the words, the bad words that you say. What this means <coughs> is that your words are the overflow of your heart. And your heart displays whether you're a true believer or not because when Jesus saves you, he gives you a new heart. He transforms you. So if Jesus has not transformed you, bad stuff will come out of your mouth and thus that will be the assurance that you are condemned because you don't have a new heart given to you by Jesus Christ. Whereas if good words come from you, it is a testament to the changed heart and life of which Jesus has done supernaturally. So again, the words do not actually mean your salvation. They are an indicator of your heart, which is an indicator of your condition. Now, does that mean saved people can't ever say bad things? Nah, that good thing too, because I would be in a lot of trouble. Okay? But that, that, that's what that means there. Uh, this is especially relevant for people who suffer less and complain more. Not that we would ever fit into that category. Did you know that there are actually two judgment seats? There is the great white throne judgment. At this judgment seat, this is, by the way, this is the... This is the one you don't want to be at. At this judgment seat, all of the individuals will have their sin placed upon themselves. And the inevitable result of everybody in this line is that they will all be convicted and all be sentenced to the lake of fire. This is the judgment seat. You don't want to be in that line. But those who are found in Christ will still be judged. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. This is where sin has already been judged on the cross. So our sin will not be upon us. It was put on Christ on the cross. So we won't be judged for our sin. We will all be acquitted. We will all be forgiven, let go free. All will be granted eternal life. However, our earthly works will be judged for rewards. So you have to understand, we're still going to face God for judgment. And even though hell is not at play because Jesus took on our penalty for our sin, even though hell's not at play, our works will be ran through the fire. 1 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. <coughs> He's talking to Christians. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 1 Corinthians 3 each one's work will become manifest for the day, speaking of the judgment day, will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. 
If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So the idea here is that there is no risk for those in this line to miss out on eternal, eternal life in Christ. But I do believe there will be weeping on that day. Now you may say, well, Josh, I thought there was no more crying in heaven. Well, the, at the point in Revelation where it mentions there will be no more crying, that's the new heavens, the new earth. That is past judgment day. There is no biblical reference to there being no crying at the judgment seat. And I, I believe that we're going to find out some of the works that we thought we're doing for God, we're actually doing for ourselves. That, that we didn't have the right motive, that we had selfishness, that, that that money that we gave to the homeless person, we wanted all the people that were sitting in the car or driving by to see that we did that. We're happy to give money to the church, but I want to hold my check just so that people can see all the, the number on it as I drop it in. An Ananias and Sapphira situation. Okay? I, I think there's going to be times when we, 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 we do things, and I, we're all guilty of this. There's going to be a lot of... Our works, they're going to throw in the fire, they're going to be burned up because there's no substance to them. There's no substance to them. We, we, it may have been a good work and Jesus may have used it, but at the end of the day, we didn't have good motive. We had hidden agendas. Uh, come on, guys. Like we, we are so guilty of this. Uh, maybe just me. You're more holier than I, I understand that. But we are so guilty of this sometimes. It's like doing anything in secret without anyone knowing kills us because I don't get any value out of it. And, but that's the things that Christ puts value in. So there's going to be a lot of works that are going to be exposed by our attitudes, our false motives, and our complaining. Because this text makes it clear that if we grumble and complain, that work will be burned up. We will find out all of the missed rewards that could have been if we had gotten our heart right and not been selfish. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore do not produce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. We've been warned. Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Good works are not good because we do them in Jesus' name. They're good because God does them through us. And when God does them through us, they are righteous and they receive due reward. I was listening to a story once of a, a person who just got done preaching a sermon. And, uh, and uh, the people, one of their first sermons, and everybody was happy and they clapped after the sermon was over. And so this, this young person went back to the back behind the stage and was feeling really good about themselves uh, from the, the applause from the, the congregation. And their mentor walked up to him and said, good job out there, but you better go to two things, or excuse me, you better go do 10 things in secret because you're not going to get a reward for that because that whole crowd just gave you your reward. So you better now go do 10 things that nobody knows about. The idea isn't some scale, justice scale where you got to balance it out. That's not the idea. The whole idea and the purpose of exaggeration is, man, man applauded for you on that. You got your reward. It's the things done in secret with the right intention that are the key. Do not grumble. This is grumbling towards people. It's grumbling towards God. Grumbling is complaining, scorning, griping, finding fault, nitpicking. He doesn't say avoid grumbling. He said you'll be judged for it, and the judge is not on vacation. He's at the door. Now, is God being unrealistic here? Of course not. He knows something that we would like to dismiss. Grumbling is something terribly toxic. Grumbling disrupts the harmony that the peace of God 
desires for our life and for his people. Grumbling tears down others instead of edifying. Grumbling lays aside a thankfulness for the blessings of God. Grumbling against people is a sign of prideful superiority. Grumbling against God is a spoiled, indifferent attitude that fails to acknowledge God for all that he has already done. I'm stepping on my own toes at this point. Grumbling about anything is a sign that we have a complete irreverence for the grace and the mercy that God has already shown us. That if we got what we deserve, we would be burning in hell right now. But because we don't, God gave us this window of repentance for those of us that know him. We don't even have to face the penalty for what we've done. And here we are complaining about what? Grumbling displays a heart, though given to Jesus, has not been fixated placed in a, in a particular spot with a singular focus and now aims at destroying the works of man and the works of God with that person's tongue. Grumbling as if, as if to say, I'm unfulfilled, I'm empty, I'm dissatisfied, even though God has already met all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And in the midst of those needs having been met, I find myself still in a place where I say, it's not enough. That's what grumbling communicates to an all-sufficient God. And it's not because that's reality. It's because in my own selfishness, I have turned to my sinful desire as a means for fulfillment because I always have to have more. I always have to be right. I always have to have it my way. Of course, God's not going to permit that. Grumbling is a heinous sin that any complaint is one that is made against the sufficient and providential will of God. Now, let's look. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to look at an Old Testament uh, story. Numbers chapter 21, fourth book of the Bible. Numbers chapter 21. <clears throat> We're going to look at verses 4 through 9. Page 231. That'll be true for you, Dave, because we have the same Bible. And Cody, we have the same Bible. Do we not? Page 231, gentlemen. Buffalo skin ESV. 167, we got 167 over here. What else we got? How far are we going in? Anybody got a large print? We in the thousands? Yeah? Maybe study Bible. Maybe study Bible in the two, three thousand. Maybe you got the MacArthur. That's, there's more text on there than the Bible sometimes. All right, let's read this together. Uh, or not together. I'll read it. You guys can just listen. From Mount Or, they sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Now, notice that there's, an, there, there's a contradiction right there in his own statement. He said there's no food and there's no water, and then all we have is this worthless food. So clearly they add food. So it's right there. They're just being dumb. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. I think God takes grumbling pretty seriously. Okay, I, I'm, I, aren't you glad that he doesn't send fiery serpents after us every time we whine and moan, right? And, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and he set it on a pole. And, and if a serpent, and he lifted it up, so you have to understand this is a foreshadow of Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. <coughs> the Israelites, who had been, they saw waters part. They saw, they had manna and water coming from a rock every day. How cool would it be having water coming from a rock every day? I get it. You're tent camping in the middle of the desert every day. Okay, I get it. 
uh, I, I, I get manna, it probably gets old after a while. But he always kept it fresh. He always gave them what they needed. And not only that, but they, they just left Egypt where they were under harsh slavery conditions, where they got beat and didn't get enough food to eat. God gave them more food and he gave them freedom. And then they still wanted to go back to slavery. Wine, 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 wine. I just want to go back to slavery. I had it better in Egypt, blah, blah, blah. And here they are in the middle again, and God's had enough. And he says, I'm just going to wipe some of you out because I'm tired of it. And I don't believe it was an accident, the ones that were bit. They weren't coming back from this grumbling thing. And grumbling is an infectious disease. It, it, it spreads so fast. All you got is one person that starts complaining, and all of a sudden, you know how it is at work. Oh, my goodness, this boss, rant, rant, rant. Oh, me too, rant, rant, rant. And all of a sudden, it's just a contagious disease where everybody gets on it. That pastor, rant, rant, rant. Just kidding, none of you do that. I know. This shows us exactly how God feels about people that are discontent, impatient, and complainers. It's a serious sin. It really is. Gumbling and complaining is a deep-seated spiritual problem. What's the problem? The problem at its core is it is a failure to trust, which is faith. It is a failure to trust God in his will. That's why it's such a big deal. It's a distrust against God and his plan for your life. God hates it, and he's killed people for less. We don't have to go guess how serious God is about it. We see it very clear in Numbers 21 as well as several other key texts. You know, I, I've met a lot of Christians in, in, in a couple of decades that I've been serving Christ. I meet ones that are all talk but won't show up when there's work to be done or there's prayer to, to be carried out. I see ones that conveniently skip out on hard stuff with lying, exaggerated excuses. I see ones that will exaggerate their sufferings of situations for pity and, and always have a, 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 a way to get out of the hard stuff. I see ones that will show up, but when they do, they will voice every living complaint that they can think of. Got to make the pastor know how much you're sacrificing and you're suffering for him, even though that's not who you're working for. I've seen people ask, who's going to be there before coming, as if the whole reason why they are wanting to be around is the people that are going to be there rather than it being for Christ. I don't know, maybe meeting a few new people along the way. I've seen a lot of that. But, but you know what is clearly in the minority? People that show up, do the hard stuff, often in secret, and say nothing about it. People that aren't there to be noticed or paraded around, just people who want to please God, even if, a, even if a, no other person ever sees it or appreciates it or, or acknowledges it. People that show up even if they're not in charge. Oh, people that, that they won't walk in any situation unless they're in charge. I don't have nothing to do with it unless I, unless I, have, I have control. People that never complain. Even if they have, uh, where are the people that, that never complain, even if they have a reason to? I mean, this, this is what James is pointing us to, that we don't grumble against each other, but whether we seek to serve and to love each other and recognizing that the thing's done in secret that nobody knows about. Yeah, okay, I get it. We all want to be appreciated and loved, but at the end of the day, the things that are done in secret, those are the things that are going to be rewarded out in front of everybody in heaven. Let us strive to be those people. And as we look to our greatest example of all, we can look to Jesus Christ. We can look to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave of himself in his whole totality. Jesus, who was God, humbled himself. He, stepped, he, stepped, he didn't step off his throne in the sense of being God, but he stepped out of his place of glory. And he put on human flesh, and he came to earth, and he submitted himself in every way as a humble servant. Born into poverty, he grew up going to the temple to learn the scriptures because he had to suffer as a, as a man. He couldn't tap into his super, he could, but he chose not to tap into his superpowers in order to make things easier for him. He chose to suffer as a man. So he had to learn. 
He had to learn the scriptures. He had to go to the temple. And, and he, 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 he endured. He suffered. He went through all of these things. He felt heartbreak at his friends passing away. He, he felt the, the struggle of his friends betraying him. He felt the, the heartbreak and in, in all of this, the going to the cross and suffering and dying. He, Jesus endured all of this. And, and through it all, he kept God's uh, solemn plan for his life the Father's plan in his singular focus. Even when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's, he's bleeding, he's, he's, he's sweating drops of blood. His focus was the Father's plan. He even asked him, God, if there's any other way, can we, can we consider that right now? But nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. He never complained. He never once said, I can't believe that we have to do this for these people that are spitting on me right now. He did it in love, and he did it without murmuring one single grumble or complaint. Let him be our example. That as we push into this life, don't don't allow the Western affluence change your attitude to become a person of grumbling and complaining, always feeling like you need some sort of recognition, some sort of control, some sort of uh, 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 awareness for every single thing that you do for the kingdom of God. But recognize that, on, that before everyone at the judgment seat of Christ, Christ is going to take all of your works and he's going to throw them in the fire. And, and I, I, here's my fear. Can I just be transparent with you with myself? Like, I feel like more of them are going to burn up than s- survive. You know what I'm saying? And, and I'm going to see what, what rewards I could have had. And I'm going to see, because those are eternal rewards. They, they, they don't get eaten by moths. They don't get destroyed by rust. These are, these are things that go on forever. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty legit. I'm hoping for a lifetime supply of Wingstop. But <laughs> as, I, as I look at the rewards... I, I'm going to see what I missed out on because I was, because I was an idiot, because I was selfish, because I was only thinking about myself, because I wanted man's applause, and so I had to make, make sure that they knew, because I failed to do the things in secret. I'm worried that more of my stuff, I don't know if you've had that worry, I worry about that, that more stuff's going to burn up than it's going to survive, and that makes me want to push in and and, 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 and do this a little bit differently. If, if for anything, whether it's rewards or not, for the glory of God. Amen. God does not, he'll use my good works that are done for selfishly. He'll use them. But it doesn't bring glory to his name like me serving him in an unselfish way. Amen. Not grumbling, not complaining, fixing my heart on a singular focus and focusing on him. And I wanna, I wanna be that person. Do you want to be that person? That's the question. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. We thank you for your kindness and your word. We thank